I don't want no oil. A spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things. A creeping and crawling. Won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Sun, don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No news. Good morning, Toledo. And good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to everyone listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and welcome to For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show on environment and ecology, and we look at environmental and ecological issues from the standpoint of how they're going to help you, help your health, help your wallet, help your family, help your, your, your level of happiness, because a healthy environment is an environment that supports you and a green future is a future with a healthy environment. And, uh, I was driving in this morning as I do every, every Sunday morning here, at 8 AM in Toledo and, uh, was looking over at the, the beautiful mommy river. A healthy environment is also a beautiful environment. I don't know if you've noticed that, but there's a whole industry that all it does is show us wonderful, beautiful films of, of the parts of the environment the parts of the world that are still healthy and in, in, in their wild state. And uh, as I was driving in, I was looking over at the Maumee and, and it was, the sun was just coming up and there was a beautiful mist rising on the river and the trees were all there, no leaves on them yet, but the outlines and some of them are budding. And, and it was one of those mornings where you could imagine uh, the tall ships on the Maumee or you could back in the early pioneer days, or you could imagine uh, canoes with, with the Native Americans paddling up the river. And it's just a reminder that, that there is some truth in beauty. You know, it's a beautiful river. We're very blessed to have it here in Northwest Ohio. And uh, we shouldn't take it for granted. And so today's guest, it's kind of interesting. Today's guest is actually a recorded interview. This is my first recorded interview. We're going to be talking with Eric Weimer who is with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And uh, we're going to be discussing the walleye run. Since this is the time of the walleyes running, uh, it's, I think we're going to dedicate this show to the walleye, to, the, to those terrific fish that come up the stream every year and, and give so many fishermen so much happiness. And uh, fishermen, walleye fishermen, it, uh, the number to call in for this show is 866-240-1065. And uh, after the interview with Eric, we're going to open up the phone lines. And I would like you guys to share your fish stories. You know, share what's the biggest walleye you've caught. You know, what's the most you've managed to catch. Um, what kind of experiences have you had fishing? This is a sports channel normally, 106.5 FM, the ticket. And some of you fishermen are prob have probably listened to this station and been like, yeah, this is great, football, baseball. You know, this is wonderful basketball. It's great listening about these these team sports. But what about fishing? Well, today is your day because when we open up the lines, I would like people to call in about the walleye, about fishing and, and sport fishing and, and what you do, what kind of jigs do you like to use, what kind, you know, what are your techniques for fishing? Or maybe you don't want to share those, but you want to give us a story about what happens to you, you know, some fish that you've caught. Uh please call in. And uh, 
idea of telling stories. That's, that's an interesting idea. That the idea of, you know, sometimes when people tell stories, they kind of stretch the truth a little. There's, there's this whole question of, of truth versus lying. And it's hard to know what's the truth these days because there's so many people that are literally being paid to spread lies, being paid to spread disinformation. And one, one of the reasons I started this show is because you can use ecological principles, you can use which are scientific principles, you can use your knowledge of the environment and ecology to help you decide, to help you choose between what is true and what is false. If you know basic scientific principles underneath, lying underneath a lot of what goes on, then you can make decisions that are based on reality. And uh, one of those truth versus lies situations came out this past week. President Trump, in a campaign stop, oh, campaigning, hmm, this, I wonder if truth ever gets stretched in political campaigns. Well, anyway, in a campaign stop in, here in Ohio, made the claim that wind turbines cause cancer, that the noise from wind turbines causes cancer. Now, there's plenty of things that cause cancer in the environment. There's chemical pollution. There's radioactive pollution. There's diet. You know, diets that are too high in fat can, can trigger colon cancer, for example. There's many, many things that cause cancer in the environment. Electromagnetic fields may cause cancer. The jury's still out on that one. But one thing that does not cause cancer is the noise from wind turbines. This has been extensively studied, and uh, the Europeans, who care a lot more about the environment than the American government, I wouldn't say that the European people care more. I'd say the average American and the average European both care about the environment equally, but the governments of Europe put that concern into practice. They, they are more likely to pass pro-environmental laws. They're more likely to do the careful study that brings you the truth about these matters than the American government because, well, let's face it, we're, our government is being overly influenced by uh, corporations with their money. And, and we have actually, we have a big story about that that'll be coming up after the break. But this situation where, where Trump is claiming that wind turbines cause cancer, uh, that's just a bald face lie. Now, it is possible I will give him the benefit of the doubt. It's possible he was talking about nuclear power plants because studies have shown that within, if you live within a five miles of a nuclear power plant, you're twice as likely to get leukemia and you're twice as likely to get uh, thyroid cancer. In fact, it was studies like that in Europe that led Germany to make the decision to abandon nuclear power altogether. So if he just misspoke, if he just said, you know, windmills instead of nuclear plants, the, the way... You might have seen the interview where he kept saying orange, oranges instead of origins. You know, if, he, if that was his mistake, well, then I could forgive him. But otherwise, it's just a, a flat-out lie. Um, but this is kind of a standard rhetorical trick for the conservatives. They, they accuse their opponents of doing what they're actually doing. So Trump is pushing nuclear power. He wants us to switch over to nukes. And so he's... You know, but the, there's this, this little problem that if you live within a few five miles of nuclear plants, you're more likely to get cancer. Um, so what does Trump do? He does the, the, the tried and true tactic. He accuses the opposition, the competition. He accuses wind power of doing the thing that nuclear power actually does. And uh, coal power also measurably can cause cancer because coal power puts things into the air, uh, pollutants of various kinds that that can cause cancer. So, you know, this is a, a tried and true technique in politics, and it's worked very well for a long time for the conservatives, but the problem is that we don't have time for those games anymore because the truth, again, is that we're on a planet that's heating up. We're, we're on a, and you know, we have to stop putting carbon in the air. We have to stop putting plastics in the ocean. Um, we can't afford to play these games anymore. And uh, I was in uh, 
I live in Bowling Green, and in Bowling Green, we're considering a an ordinance to ban plastic bags. And there, you know, I I'm seeing the same rhetorical technique used by the conservatives who want to block this. They're 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 accusing people of lying who are telling the truth. When and some of the arguments they're making against plastic bags are in fact themselves lies. So, you know, it's a confusing world, but if you have some basic biological and scientific and chemical information, you can make sense of that. And that's what our guest is going to be doing in just a just a couple of minutes. We're going to switch over to our pre recorded interview with Eric Weimer. Um one other little point of information uh, that supports this idea. I had on my, I meant to have on my show live last week, uh, Libby Halevi, who was uh, an expert on the Three Mile Island situation. We didn't get her on the show live, but I did do an interview with her, which is up on our YouTube channel for A Green Future. And uh, the whole interview is there. And those of you who are listening in Columbus on Saturday, you, you got to hear, hear a portion of that interview in your uh, broadcast. But she pointed out that the 15-mile radius around Three Mile Island has the highest rates of thyroid cancer and leukemia in the country. And this is not a surprise. If you know about the effect of radi- radioactive poisoning, if you know about the effect that these radio- radioactive atoms that they're putting in the air, you're not going to be surprised by this fact. And you're going to be able to make the link between the Three Mile Island accident where radioactive things were put into the environment and then people developed cancer. You're going to make that connection, whereas the nuclear industry does not want you to make that connection. They, they say, oh, it's just a coincidence that the people who live in the area with, that had the worst nuclear accident in U.S. commercial reactor history have developed cancer at higher rates. But, yeah. So, but the truth is... The truth is obvious if you have a basic understanding. And that's why I am I invited Eric Weimer on. And uh, we're going to get to his interview in just a second. And don't worry, those of you that are listening for sports, this is 106.5 FM, The Ticket. Sports will be back at 9 o'clock with uh, Mick Gonzalez and the Cheap Seats. So your your regular sports program will continue. And uh, just But just take this hour, just this little one hour to think about some larger issues. Um, I wanted to say I am the political director for the Ohio Green Party, but in this show, I don't speak for the Ohio Green Party. I speak only for myself, and the same is for, true for all my guests, and um, hopefully we'll get some guests after the interview at 866-240-1065. We, all, we all only speak for ourselves, and if you want more information about this show, you can find us on the web at Joe Demar for a green future dot org. That's J O E D E M A R E F O R a green future dot org. Uh, we have a YouTube channel for a green future, and uh, we have a podcast for a green future, which is hosted on Podomatic dot com. And finally, we do have a Patreon page. If you like what you hear and you'd like to support it, um, check us out on Patreon for a green future, and you can sign up. If you like to um, support us with a few dollars every month and help keep this program on the air. All right. So without further ado, uh, Daniel, let's listen to our interview with Eric Weimer. Eric Weimer, thanks for coming on for a green future. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay. Could you share with our audience just uh, what your title is and, and, and what you do every day? Uh, Certainly. Um, I am the currently the supervisor of the um, Lake Erie Fisheries Unit office in Sandusky. Um, I uh, have been here uh, at this office since 2005 uh, as a biologist working on Lake Erie for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources uh, Divisional Wildlife. Um, over my career, I've worked uh, with a, a variety of different assessment projects and research projects. I've worked with our uh, trawl assessment program, with our nearshore uh, fish community survey, with some habitat work and some lower trophic level assessment that we do. Uh, been involved with a, a lot of different things um, in my current position. I oversee 
uh, staff that includes four biologists, a research vessel operator, and some additional staff that kind of essentially our, our, our goal is to uh, assess the Lake Erie fishery uh, and, you know, specifically walleye and yellow perch and other uh, high-value species. Um, mm-hmm. estimate their populations and and help to set regulations to ensure we don't uh, over harvest or, or damage our our uh, Lake Erie fisheries. All right, great. Well, we're we're happy to have you on, and uh, this is the time of year out here in uh, northwestern Ohio, uh, particularly along the Maumee River, where we see thousands of fishermen out there in the river. They've got their waders, they've got their boats, and they're they're out for the walleye run. So I wanted to, to focus on the walleye run and uh, maybe go a little bit from sort of the, the basic biology of it up to, you know, how maybe some things fishermen might be interested in. So um, so I just wanted to start with a very basic question. Uh, why do the walleye run? And, you know, where are they headed when they run? So w- when we talk about a walleye run, we're talking about uh, spawning uh, behavior. Uh, this is the time of the year when walleye are spawning. Um, so essentially, uh, all the, the the large population of Lake Erie walleye uh, spawn in, in really just a, a handful of locations. Uh, the vast majority of, of fish spawn uh, in the western basin on some of the reefs and around the islands. Um, we also get a, a good strong run of walleye that go into the Detroit River, uh, the Maumee River, and the Sandusky River. And there are a few other locations as well. But what they're, what they're doing is looking for um, essentially spawning habitat. Um, they, they require or prefer to spawn on top of gravel and cobble substrates, so uh, rocky substrates, uh, where their eggs can sit uh, down in the interstitial spaces between the, the gravel and the rocks and be oxygenated by the flow of water until they can uh, they then hatch and the, the larvae will, will drift out to their larval habitat to grow. So the, the rivers are an important component to that, even though the majority of Lake Erie walleye do spawn out in the main lake. Uh, the rivers provide a, a neat opportunity for them uh, to, in certain years when you have bad weather conditions out on the main lake, the rivers can really um, drive uh, reproduction in Lake Erie uh, during those bad bad weather springs when mm-hmm. conditions just aren't quite right. Okay, so so they're looking for, for gravelly parts of the, the riverbed, uh, and pretty much, do they pretty much stay in the rivers, or do they go all the way up into the little tributaries up into the, you know, as small as they can get? Well, um, I, th- I think in in most systems uh, that, that have uh, unimpeded access, that the walleye will travel a, a fairly long way up into tributaries. Um, our, our systems here in Ohio uh, have um, dams that have been built over the years, that kind of impede their movement up into those highest areas. So I guess I don't really know what they would do in in the Sandusky or the Maumee rivers, um, but we do know that they travel quite a long ways, that mm-hmm. they um, move towards these high-quality spawning substrates, and uh, and they, you know, particularly looking for gravel and sand and uh so you have places on the Maumee River uh, in particular, starting around the city of Perrysburg, Orleans Park, and upstream from there that uh, really have a, an awful lot of walleye that come up and spawn on those substrates there. Nice. That's really the beginning of the good quality subs, uh, spawning substrate for walleye. Mm-hmm. How old are, are the, the uh, walleye when they start running, when they come up to spawn? We, we typically see walleye uh, hit sexual maturity uh, at about age three for males and uh, starting in age four for females. Um, we, we, there's some, you know, some fish come up a little earlier than that. It's not 
it's not unusual to for us in the work that we do in the rivers to find a, a two-year-old male uh, running around. But the the vast majority of um, three-year-olds will will be um, mature uh, as males, mm-hmm. and uh, females develop a little bit slower. So it's it's four-year-olds for them, um, and then the you know they will spawn um, right up until. Uh, the end of their their life, they they will spawn continuously through their life. Mm-hmm. And, and how long can they live? You know, um, they can actually live a surprisingly long time. Um, we have aged um, uh, male walleye uh, well over twenty years old. Wow! Uh, out of Lake Erie, huh. uh, we use an otolith, which is an inner ear bone. Uh, to age fish, we can uh, remove that that inner ear bone and look at it through a microscope. And essentially, each each uh, year it grows a ring on it, just like a tree does. And mm-hmm. so it's very accurate. And uh, and so we've I think the oldest fish that we've aged was 26 years old. Wow, uh, that's pretty rare. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's usually um, it's usually uh, not that many fish that are over 20. Right. But we do see them about every year. So, um, so they get bigger every year, right? So a 26-year-old fish would probably be a pretty good catch, as they say. It, it, it really depends. So um, females tend to continue growing in length um, throughout their lifetime uh, because they have, uh, the larger a female gets, the more um, eggs that she can develop and so she gets a reproductive advantage by having more eggs. Um, males, on the other hand, tend to really slow their growth down once they hit about 20 or 21 inches in length. Um, so they really don't grow very much um, after they hit 20 or, or 22 inches. They, they will continue to grow, but they do not get nearly as big as the females. Hmm. So typically, if you see a large fish, um, you know, a 30 plus inch fish that's um, almost 100% of the time that's going to be a female. Hmm. Um, and while we do occasionally see bigger males, uh, they're, they're actually pretty rare. Okay. And so most big, most old males tend to be in the, you know, 22 to 24, 25 inch range. Okay. Um, what do the walleye eat when they're out in the environment and in the lake? Um, and, and what eats them? So walleye can eat a variety of different uh, forage items, uh, and it really depends on how old they are and uh, how big they are. Um, so when uh, walleye are, are uh, larval or juvenile fish and are, are just starting to uh, consume prey items, they will feed on um, zooplankton and invertebrates, uh, things like mayflies can be an important part of their diet. Um, and then as they get bigger, then they switch over to eating f- uh, food forage. Um, what they eat really depends on what part of the lake they're in. So here in the west basin of Lake Erie, uh, gizzard shad are a really important forage item for walleye. Um, emerald shiners can be as well, um, and they will eat a variety of other things if their preferred forage prey is not available. As you get further east in Lake Erie, uh, you see more uh, rainbow smelt uh, being part of their their diets. Uh, and and honestly, when you get down to the east basin of Lake Erie, down in in uh, New York waters and such, rainbow smelt have traditionally been. Uh, really the dominant uh, forage item for for walleye down there. Hmm. Um, But they are opportunistic, and so we we see a variety of things in their diets. But, uh, you know, here in the east or in the west, Mm -hmm. it's really, especially in the fall, it's a gizzard shad diet that they're feeding on. Okay. And uh, and what eats them? Well, when they're small, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, other predators that that can consume walleye um, but but really in Lake Erie once they reach you know a juvenile age you know they they really are 
too big to be consumed by a lot of predators. So really for adult walleyes, um, the only real predator is us. So, <laughs> so okay, so we eat them. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> well, and they're pretty good, too. I've had they are some. delicious, yeah. yes. All right. So um, now when you, we would have the run, we're, what are the sort of the ideal conditions that we're looking for in a run in terms of temperature, water levels, that sort of thing? Right. So um, while I prefer to spawn somewhere between 40 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit, um, that's probably mid forties to, to mid fifties is kind of the, the, the sweet spot for them. Um, they, you know, they really, you know, I don't know that water level, uh, as long as they can access the, uh, spawning habitat that they need to, I don't know. Water level doesn't have a lot to do with it. However, um, in the spring, when we have our spring precipitation and the water levels and flows go up in the river, then uh, it uh, gives them access to more uh, spawning habitat. So uh, areas that are high and dry in the summertime um, will be inundated and available for them to use in the winter. Um, we do find that uh, pulses of spring rain, um, well, anglers will tell you at least that uh, when you get a nice pulse of rain and, and the flows go uh, up a little bit, that that will attract walleye into the rivers for spawning. And uh, we see that with other species as well. Okay. So um, that spring rain is important, uh, at least as a spawning cue, if not for providing them uh, habitat, or at least access to habitat. Okay. Um, um, moon phase, sorry, sorry oh, to interrupt. Oh, go oh no, go, go on. Say moon phase can also play a part in it, too. So we oh. typically look at the calendar, and, and we, we know that around here uh, in the Maumee River and the Sandusky River that we start seeing walleye show up um, in spawning areas by the middle end of March, and, and they're typically in the rivers until the end of April. Um, but the moon can also uh, influence spawning activity. We, we've seen out on the main lake in particular that when we have a uh, full moon, the, the spawning activity seems to uh, increase a, a, a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, the know, walleye, just, so the walleye are a romantic fish. <laughs> yes, long okay. strolls under the moonlight. You got it. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, all right, so how much of an economic impact does this uh, does the walleye have for Ohio? I mean, and are there other runs around the state with some other other species of fish, perhaps? Sure. So it's it's hard for uh, to separate um, just the impact of walleye uh, on um, our economy, but uh, the uh, American Sport Fishing Association. Um, tracks uh, the, the, the value of sport fishing uh, in, across the United States. And their last report uh, showed that uh, sport fishing or recreational fishing uh, on Lake Erie uh, was an over a billion dollar uh, boost to the Ohio economy each year. Wow. So it's a, it's a significant um, part of our, especially our lakeshore um, uh, communities, um, and it's not only the sale, the, like direct sales of, you know, fishing equipment and and boat ramps and and other things like that, but it's also all of the money that anglers spend when they when they come into town, staying at hotels and restaurants, um, and and just all of the the money that they spend associated with a trip to fish for uh, fish on Lake Erie. Uh, really adds up to a lot of jobs and a lot of money into our economy. It's mm -hmm. a really important part of what we do up here along the lake shore. Mm -hmm. So, what are some of the challenges facing the the fishery, and you know, how do you ensure that the fish are harvested at at sustainable rates? Sure. Well, uh, maybe I'll I'll get to the second half of that question first. Um, okay. So, w with the divisional wildlife, um, we spend our year uh, out on the lake doing fisheries assessments. Uh, spring, summer, and fall, we are doing different types of work 
to estimate the number of uh, adult fish. We do other surveys like our trawl surveys to estimate the number of um, young young of year fish, so the fish that are hatched each spring so that we know what they'll be contributing in the future as they uh, grow. Uh, we also do harvest assessment surveys, so we have creel clerks that uh, interview anglers as they return from fishing trips uh, that uh, will um, help us generate estimates, estimates of um, harvest for the different species of fish. Um, and so we, every winter, will take that assessment data and we will um, meet with biologists from Michigan, from Pennsylvania, from New York, and from Ontario. And they bring their data sets and we bring ours and we kind of combine them all together and so that we have more of a lake-wide snapshot of the fishery each year. And then we run through, uh, run this data through some pretty complex um, mathematical models that will estimate uh, population sizes for walleye and other um, key uh, species of fish. And uh, that process then goes to um, the Lake Erie Committee, which is made up of representatives from each of the states, who then decide uh, how many fish we can safely remove from the lake each year and how to divvy that out between the, the different agencies. Uh, at the end of that process, uh, here in Ohio, we get a quota uh, or a total allowable catch uh, from uh, the Lake Erie Committee that we can then um, divvy out to uh, our anglers. So we get, we get quotas for different species. Uh, for walleye, our quota goes entirely to uh, recreational fishing. Mm -hmm. And then we ensure that um, using some other estimates uh, of harvest rates and um, and effort by our recreational anglers, we can then set bag limits so that we don't exceed our total allowable catch. So that's really what the bag limits are there for, is to keep us from uh, going over our quota each year and doing um, doing any harm to the, the Lake Erie population of, of walleye and other, other fish species. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, a full year of activities that lead up to um, the regulations being approved and, and uh, published each year. And then the work starts all over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah. I know that like in the Norwegian cod fishery, um, the, you know, catch allowed by humans and the commercial catch, they look at to about 10% of the population annually. And then, uh, you know, during the spawning, animals and whales and, and things take about 1%. Um, so do you have an idea or a handle on sort of what percentage of the total population uh, we're taking? Or um, So I'm, I'm trying to remember all the numbers right off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't have those numbers in front of me right at this okay. moment. So but, I, I could. I could definitely get those to you. But we, um, but we. But we're seeing. You know. But the fishery is sustaining. And, well, and yeah. Sustainable. So I can. I can give you um, numbers based on last year. So last year, the estimated population of walleye in Lake Erie was um, forty-one million fish. Uh, oh, that, nice. that are that were two year old or older. So mm -hmm. these are all adult walleye. So 41 million of those fish. The Ohio quota um, we last year. Well, Ohio harvested uh, two million fish last year. Mm -hmm. So it um, and then uh, similar amounts were harvested. Um, the quota gets divvied out based on uh, surface area, essentially. Mm -hmm of um, what each state or province owns of the lake. So uh, mm -hmm. Ohio gets a, a pretty big chunk of that. And mm -hmm. we, were, we were under quota uh, by a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I don't remember what last year's quota was. Okay. I'm just always happy when we stay below it. Yeah, so, so the majority, you know, we're just taking a small percentage, and, and right. most of the fish get to live out their, their lives there. So what are some of the challenges facing the uh, the fishery? 
Well, you know, the, I think the the biggest challenge is the the fishery itself, or or Lake Erie itself. So, with such a big lake, um, it, it it's very challenging uh, for me and for my biologist here to um, to 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 get out and get all the data that we need year to year. It's it's a challenging environment to sample and we can't just go out and count fish as they, you know, swim by. Uh it, it's a it's a complex way to, to use the data. Um the the same thing goes for um the environmental conditions in the lake that influence what makes a successful walleye hatch. Um it's it's Lake Erie herself that drives all of that. Um do we have, um, you know, do we have a nice cold winter with a gradual warming spring that will uh, provide the right kind of food for larval walleye when they hatch? You know, some years that happens and some years it doesn't. Um, do we have um, winds and currents out in the main lake that push the larval fish before they, they're free swimming, push those into um, inshore uh, nursery habitats, or areas where they'll be a little more protected and have lots of food, or do they get pushed offshore into uh, unproductive areas with less food, uh, where they'll they'll starve and die? Um, you know, Lake Erie is really the driver, and and she's the biggest challenge for us uh, managing the fishery. Um, and uh, aquatic invasive species are a tremendous challenge, uh, and once they get into a lake, they're often here quite a while before they're even detected because of the size of Lake Erie. Um, you know, nutrients. With a, such a big lake, you have a humongous watershed, and, and nutrient-related issues are a challenge. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, because the lake is so big, we don't have very many management levers that we can pull to um, improve the fishery uh, and, and make large-scale changes. So that's really the challenge: is how to how to best address the issues that we have um, with the available resources that we have on such a large uh, water body. All right. Well, this has been a, a fascinating look at the, the ecology of walleye, and uh, this program, you know, airs uh, initially in Toledo on, at eight o'clock to nine o'clock in the morning, and so this could be heard by some fishermen right now who are heading out to go fishing. So uh, would you, as a biologist, do you have any advice for the, the uh, oh, walleye uh, fishermen? Oh, sure, sure. I can tell them lots of things. Um, I don't know how useful it'll be. Um, I guess, you know, the first thing this time of year, you know, we always encourage people to be safe, especially I know the, the water levels have been high on the Maumee, and we have more rain in, in the forecast for the next 10 days or so. Um, so just being safe, the, the, I know the ice did a lot of damage along the, the Maumee at some of the places, and access has, has been a bit challenging this year. Um, you know, Just remember that the majority uh, of the fish that you get to bite during a spawning run are not actively feeding for their nutrition. They are uh, more reacting to, to something that, that uh, is in their face, um, and that uh, so having... You know, in the rivers especially, using uh, Carolina rigs with uh, floating jig heads and, and bright colored um, uh, plastics attached to them are, are always a good method. Um, I'd also mention that um, post-spawn fish, when they are recovering from spawning, and they, they really start to feed to, to recover during that time, and they can be uh, really susceptible in areas that are downstream from from spawning uh, or or offshore from spawning habitats, uh, so those are those are important uh, things to consider too. Once the spawn starts to wind down, is uh, where you're fishing and and uh, and maybe you can um, find areas where they're holding fish as they're recovering from spawning activities that that might uh, might up your might odds hit, of, of catching a few. Might hit that bait a little harder there. They might yeah. they might just do that, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, Eric, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, pleasure's all mine. Yeah, and hopefully maybe we can have you on in the future for some other uh, biological insights to the to what's going on in Lake Erie. That would be great.
All right. Well, thank you very much. That was Eric Weimer. He was the fishery biologist supervisor at the Sandusky Fisheries Research Station. All right. Well, have a great day. Thank you. All right. And we are back live at 106.5 FM, the ticket here on For a Green Future. Did you enjoy that? I, I enjoyed that. I, I had intended to trim that down to about a 20-minute interview, but as I was listening to it, I, I couldn't decide where to cut out because it was all the information was kind of fascinating. And uh, we're very lucky to have a such a healthy walleye run here in northwest Ohio, and, and we're lucky that the lake is healthy enough to support it. And, you know, I think we should feel a little a little gratitude for that. I think it's important to to feel thankful. It's not just something that's it's all right. Of course, we should be getting all these fish. No, it's a lot. Most places in the world don't get anything like this these days. Um, so, fishermen, time for your fish stories. 866-240-1065. 866-240-1065. What was the biggest walleye you ever caught? What sort of fish stories do you have to share with the, with Northwest Ohio and, and the rest of the listening audience? Give us a call, 866-240-1065. And in the meantime, uh, we will listen to messages from our wonderful sponsors. Uh, one of our sponsors is the Wood County Park District. Uh, the Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging program, and they teach people to love and respect nature, restoring wildlife habitats, and leading outdoor adventures. And uh, they have kind of an aesthetic adventure going right now. They've got a Friends of the Park nature photo exhi exhibition, and that's at the Four Corner Center in Bowling Green. That's at 130 South Main Street. That's uh, That used to be a bank. It's been uh, repurposed. It's a big old building, but you go in there, and you can see beautiful photographs of the nature in Wood County, and there's there's plenty of it because Wood County Parks protects 20 parks and nature preserves around Wood County, and all of them are open from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. And uh, at the at Seago Park, they have a volunteer opportunity coming up, and you can register for volunteer opportunities at wcparks.galaxydigital.com. And uh, it's a conservation volunteer day. That will be Tuesday, April 16th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, you can get out there and help get Otsego Park ready for the summer. And then on Sunday, April 28th, is the Community Earth Day celebration. That's going to be held at the Montessori School at 515, South, or 515 Sandridge Road. You don't have to register. Just come and park, and all the activities are free. You could learn how to go green and find fun resources. Um, and that's April 28th from 2 to 4 p.m. Then uh, there's the annual plant sale for the Wood County Park District. That's the native plant sale. That's May 11th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And there's, they have over 40 varieties of locally sourced native plants, so local genome native plants. They're available on a first-come, first-served basis. They're only $4 each. So if you want to have in your lawn or in your garden or if you're landscaping, have some native plants, which can be very beautiful and very beneficial to wildlife, um, just four bucks each. And that's uh, Sunday, April, that's uh, Saturday, May 11th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, so we're very happy. There's a lot of other ways to get information about what the Wood County Park Districts are up to. You can go to their Facebook page, Wood County Park District, or on Twitter, they're Wood Park Dist. And at Instagram, also Wood Park Dist. And finally, if you want to register to volunteer at the parks, that's wcparks.galaxydigital.com. And our other sponsor for this hour is Damar Consulting. Damar Consulting is a computer consulting uh, firm. They will come to your house and they will help you with your computer problems, no matter what those problems are. If your computer needs reformatting, if you need to get a new computer, uh, they'll help you pick out a new computer. If you need to transfer data from an old computer to a new computer, they can do that too. Um, they provide a wide variety of services, and everyone employed at DeMar Consulting has a degree in computer science. So you know they know what they're doing. Um, the way to get in touch with them, very simple. One is their website, demarconsulting.com. 
That's D-E-M-A-R-E, the word consulting, dot C-O-M. And the other is you can call them or text them at 419-973-3000. That's 419-973-3000. And they'll respond right away and get out there to help you. And uh, they specialize in helping people who are perhaps of a slightly older generation. You know, those of us who remember computers as being these big things that filled rooms and uh, mysterious guys in white coats were the only ones who could make them work. If you could remember that, then you might be at the age bracket that you might want to call DeMar Consulting to have a hand in uh, dealing with your modern 21st century computer because they, they know what they're doing. All right. So still looking for some fish stories. It's not often people will actually ask you to tell them a fish story, but that's exactly what we're doing here today because we're, we're celebrating the walleye on For a Green Future. So if you've got one, please call in 866-240-1065. That's 866-240-1065. There's been some uh, interesting news, environmental news, in the past uh, week or so. One is that there's a report out of Cleveland that some of the details on this proposed nuclear bailout are coming are coming to light, uh, are leaking out here and there. This is something we've been following since we started For a Green Future back in January. And what is going on is the Ohio State Legislature is considering giving First Energy billions of dollars in, in bailout money to keep the davis Bessey nuclear plant and the Perry nuclear plant going. Now, it, it, all, it appears that First Energy made direct campaign contributions to some of the very politicians who are promoting this legislation. So there's a, a very straightforward uh, negation of democracy, you might say. But it's looking like that they're, they're kind of getting a little scared of what they're proposing here. I, I noticed that they have a... Um, they started a, an AstroTurf organization, you know, which is when you pretend you've got a citizens group and you take out ads and do uh, actions and stuff, but really all you've got are some employees that you've paid to pretend that they're... Uh, so the First Energy started this AstroTurf group that's on Facebook, and they've been posting things on there and trying to support it. And I've noticed that their posts are not getting many likes. They're not getting shared a lot. Uh, because I think people are realizing that this is nothing but uh, taking money from us and giving it to First Energy for an unnecessary plant. Wind and solar are here. They're of age. They're, they are able to produce enough power to replace these nuclear plants without the danger of meltdown or without having to deal with the nuclear waste. And so they've kind of, the report out of Cleveland is that this legislation is not going to actually say nuclear power anywhere. It's going to call itself a Clean Air Support Act, but the only thing is that it's not going to support wind or solar power. So it's going to call itself the Clean Air Support Act. We're going to give money to utilities that are producing power in a clean manner, but it, but we're not going to give any money to wind or solar. <laughs> So they're, they're thinking, oh, so that only leaves nuclear. So, so it's like a tricky, backhanded, dishonest way to just give First Energy millions of your, of your dollars in upping your utility bill. It does look now, now like the report is that this is going to be funded by increasing your utility bill as opposed to coming out of taxes or something like that. So uh, don't fall for it. And... Uh, I actually wrote, or I called Teresa Gavarone's office about this. I, I live in Bowling Green. We we only have a state senator right now. We do not have a uh, representative in the Ohio House of Representatives. Um, so Gavarone's my only state legislator. I, I called her and asked for a letter telling her, you know, what's your position on this? And she sent me back a letter which was sort of classic political double speak in which she didn't admit to having any position on this. She just sort of said, I will be looking at this closely. Well, <laughs> well, I actually happened to be, um, I was running for, as a green, I was running for Bowling Green City Council 
in the year that uh, Teresa Gavaron was first running. And I'll never forget that at the League of Women Voters debates, uh, she got up there and her answer to every single question was, I don't know, I don't have enough information on that topic, I'll look it up and I'll get back to you. <laughs> and that's what she's still doing now as a state senator. She basically sent a letter saying, I don't know. The, the only thing is that she actually does know. You know, when she gets into office, she votes with the Republicans on anti-environmental and conservative legislation. And so she knows what she's going to do. She's just not admitting it in a letter to a constituent. So uh, talking about the, the whole bending of the truth thing that happens so often. So it's not a good deal for Ohio. It's something we need to block, and it's something we're going to be paying more attention to as it goes forward, but that's the latest on that. Now, one other thing that came along this past week is, um, as you may recall, we've had on past shows, we had um, the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. We did several shows on that before it got passed by the city of Toledo, which has made waves all over the world, actually. In fact, Marky Miller, who was uh, twice a guest on this show, is going, is Apparently, she's going to be. She's been invited to speak before the United Nations to talk about the Lake Erie Bill of Rights because it's such a radical idea to recognize the legal rights of a of a body of water. And uh, at the time, we knew that three hundred thousand dollars was being spent to fight the Lake Erie Bill of Rights to convince people not to do it. And the the thrust of all those commercials was the same. They were saying this is the work of out of town activists. This is, you know, not a Toledo thing. So the people in the city of Toledo should not vote for it. Well, it turns out the campaign finance uh, information finally came out this past week. All those ads were being paid for by BP and not even the local BP division that has the, you know, the, the, the refinery here. They were being paid for by BP out of Texas. And so, you know, they were the ultimate out of towners. They were their their company was based out of Texas and their their parent company is based out of England. That's why it's British Petroleum. So here we have, you know, there's talk about Russia influencing American elections. Here's an a British company trying to tell Toledoans how to vote on an issue and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. So so it's just some idea of what what we're up against is we're, we're trying to bring the world towards a green future, but don't get discouraged because we will succeed. We will stop the petroleum industry, the, the fossil fuel industry, and we will stop putting plastics in the ocean and, and because we have to. We, this is something, you know, this is one of those things. Nobody wants to actually deal with it, but at some point you have to deal with it if you want to keep going as a society. And how do I know we're, we're going to deal with it? Well, because every week I get a letter from the future. I get a letter from my great-great-granddaughter, Marie I, who's living on the Kola Peninsula, working on a project. They're going to put the nuclear waste that we're generating today, they're going to inject it down into the Earth's mantle. And she's a uh, bacteriologist there, and she's uh, working hard on this project. And so... Every week, there's a flash of photons next to my bed, and I get this letter from the future. And so here is this week's letter from the future. Dear great-great-grandpa, greetings from the future. It always sounds so dramatic when I write that. Of course, your future is my daily life. What must seem exotic for you is, of course, not exactly boring, but I would say natural to me. I've been thinking about how my day-to-day -day life is different from yours. I'd have to say one of the biggest is cars. From what I understand, people in your time used to spend at least an hour a day locked into little metal boxes with rubber wheels, speeding along, smashing into each other, burning oil at an incredible rate, and never even thinking about how weird that was. I have only been in a car a few times in my life. When we want to go somewhere, we either walk or ride our bikes, if it's close, or we take a train if it's far. All our trains are solar-powered. I guess the first solar-powered trains were just coming online in your time. Now the design has improved so much that we travel 200 miles an hour powered just by the sun. 
but most of the time we don't have to travel at all. I regularly meet with colleagues from all over the world. We just do it virtually. Of course, sometimes I wish it wasn't so easy to communicate. I've told you about my friend Igor, who's living the traditional life of the Sami, and he's out traveling with the reindeer herds. Back in your time, that would have meant he was out of touch. Now he's able to video with me every night after he sets up camp and gets his campfire going. He's asked me to be his exclusive girlfriend and told me he wants to get married in a traditional Sami ceremony. I don't know what to do. I really, really like Igor, but I also really like Michael. Michael and I have been getting along great since he discovered that new silicon crystal and saved the whole drilling project. But I haven't told Michael that I've been videoing with Igor every night. I don't know why. Normally I tell him everything. Were things this complicated back in your time? It's very frustrating, but I am a scientist. I've decided to look at this scientifically and rationally to decide what I'm going to do. Unfortunately, that hasn't worked yet. Anyway, that's all for this week. Keep going, great-great-grandpa. We'll figure this out. Love, Marie I. So, a little, uh, little trouble there in the future for my great-great-granddaughter, but I'm sure she'll figure it out. Okay, so we've got about four minutes left at 866-240-1065. Uh, give us a call, and, and I'd like to hear at least one fish story. I'd like to hear at least one fisherman share this experience he's had uh, maybe out there on the mommy catching some catching some walleye i uh, i do some fishing myself uh, not nearly as much as i'd like to but it's something that you know there, there's there's a connection there there's there's when you're standing in the water or on the bank and you you've got your line in the water and you get that that hit you know when that when the fish bites um, there's really kind of nothing like it because you know intellectually that there's this mysterious world under there, that there's um, all kinds of invertebrates like crayfish and, and uh, dragonfly larvae. They're there in the water, and the fish are hunting for them all the time, and they're hiding, and then there's the little microscopic plankton that are up on the top surface of the water, and the minnows are there eating that microscopic plankton. And then the fish hunt the minnows. And, and this sort of drama is going on all the time. And you just don't see it because all, all we see is the surface of the water. But when you've got a line in the water and, and you get that hit from a, a big fish on your line, that mysterious world all of a sudden becomes real. It's like, it's like there it is. There really are. There really is stuff going on down there. There's a whole world under the water. And unless you're in a scuba outfit you don't nor or snorkeling you don't normally get to see it um but the few times that i have seen you know signs of that deep underwater world uh, have been amazing i i like to camp up in michigan on a remote island up there with my family and uh, a few years back we were up there and my wife and i were on the, the shore and we saw a sturgeon come in to shore i don't know what it was hunting for, but this thing was tremendous. I, I, it looked to be like it was about eight feet long, and I could see the bony knobs on its back, those bony plates. And uh, we learned today that walleye can live 25, 26 years. Sturgeon can live over 100 years. So this was a, a tremendous fish. Um, another time when I was up there, I was uh, snorkeling, and I saw these three carp, huge carp, come along. And I actually saw them cooperative hunting. I saw they would come up to these rocks, and one carp would r swim up and butt this rock and move it, and the little crayfish and stuff would jump out. And uh, the other carp would zoom in and, and eat the, the crayfish that jumped out. And, then, and they were, the three of them were taking turns doing that. That was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, and I've never heard that described anywhere before so anyway we've come to the end uh, sorry fisherman you can call next week with a fish story if you've got one thank you so much for listening this has been joe damar and for a green future i've enjoyed every minute with you thanks shoreline, i like fish much better than crud i like birds and things a free